Oscar Sarkaro, the editor and publisher of Jacobin, and welcome to this Saturday night mm-hmm. edition of Stay at Home. Um, you know, given the circumstances, I know you guys don't even have to feel bad about not having any other plans on a Saturday night, but I would probably be do, doing uh, very little else other than, you know, reading left-wing tracks and arguing on the internet. But um, for those of you um, not familiar with this, this lifestyle, uh, this is the 16th episode of the Stay at Home series, where most days at 6 p.m. Eastern, we're talking with a left-wing thinker, then doing a brief Q&A. Um, and if you want to participate in that Q&A, all you have to do is um, put something in the uh, YouTube chat, that little box to your, your right. Uh, tomorrow we're off, but on Monday we're back on with John Clegg, who's doing a presentation on the relationship between capitalism and slavery. Um, and John Clegg's a contributor to Jacobin and Catalyst, our kind of sister publication or journal. And uh, it should be a really interesting conversation. Uh, then the day after we have Branker McCredick, and he is the author of Yesterday's Man, The Case Against Joe Biden, and a Jackman staff writer. And he'll be, well, making the case against Joe Biden. Uh, but Yesterday's Man's a really well-researched, really thorough book. It's not a, a polemic. It's a very uh, careful, I think, the most thorough uh, political and intellectual biography of, of Joe Biden. He takes him seriously as a thinker, what he represents. And, um, you know, he uh, ends up with a very damning uh, book. So whatever your decision is going to be in November, it's definitely worth um, understanding the nature of Biden, the forces that he's uh, been supporting his whole life. And, um, you know, if he is in the, the White House, what kind of policies he's most likely to, um, to pursue? This is really the embodiment of the third way turn of the Democratic Party, just as much as figures like Bill Clinton, that we associate more with the, the third way. Um, so just, um, you know, a brief introduction while people are still logging on. Obviously, you know, this series is something we've been doing um, almost every night. Um, since uh, kind of the beginning of, of the, the, the quarantine for the last like two weeks, maybe a little bit more. Uh, we're also putting out a, a weekly YouTube show with Anna Kasparian and Michael Brooks, which just debuted uh, earlier today. So you should check that out as well. And we're not fundraising. We're not asking for money at this point. Um, probably sometime in November and December, we're going to definitely need our yearly fundraising drive. But in the meantime, what we're asking you to do is just press uh, like on this video, uh, press subscribe, and um, you know share it with your friends. And that's that's all. It's a pretty simple ask. We know people have more pressing concerns, especially in this economic environment. So a non-monetary ask. Just please press press uh, subscribe and, and share this video with your friends. Uh, tonight, I'm very pleased to have um, joining us uh, Matt Brunig, who's been a long time Jacobin. Uh, collaborator. Uh, he's been someone who we've been uh, publishing, uh, debating, uh, hanging out with for many years, uh, well before uh, there was actually an audience for these uh, these sorts of debates. Uh, I'm very pleased there is um, one now too. Um, and obviously a lot of you uh, know his work with the People's Policy uh, Project, but this is one of the few places actually producing uh, the type of, of uh, research that should be turned into legislation, especially now that we're developing a block of left-wing Congress people. You know, it's more vital than ever. So please do, um, you know, support him on uh, Patreon, support the, the whole uh, project. Uh, today, Matt will be discussing the Nordic model, how it works, why its outcomes are still, even in state today, so much better than the outcomes in the United States and uh, what we on the left uh, should, should make of it. So without further ado, I'm gonna let uh, Matt present for around 25 or so minutes. Uh, then after that, um, we'll, we'll do a Q&A. So please uh, drop your, your questions in and we'll go through and, um, and, and ask uh, Matt a few of them afterwards. But thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you, Bosker. Um, yeah, so I'm sure if you follow politics uh, to some degree, especially on the left, you've heard a lot of people talk about the Nordic model or countries like Norway, Sweden, and Denmark. Uh, and I think we have a clip of, uh, of one Bernie Sanders doing just that. And I think we should look to countries like Denmark, like Sweden, and Norway, and learn from what they have accomplished for their working people. 
In countries like Denmark, where Pete correctly pointed out, they have a much higher quality of life in many respects than we do. And if we know that in countries in Scandinavia, like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, they are very democratic countries. Obviously, the voter turnout is a lot higher than it is in the United States. In those countries, health care is a right of all people. In those countries, college education, graduate school is free. Uh, in those countries, retirement benefits, child care are stronger than in the United States of America. And in those countries, by and large, government works for ordinary people in the middle class rather than, as is the case right now in our country, uh, for the billionaire I class. Can hear so, you know, as much as people talk about it or reference these countries, there is maybe somewhat less discussion of what uh, the countries actually consist of. What are their economic institutions? What kind of benefits do they have? You know, what makes the Nordic model the Nordic model? Um, and this is a question that I became interested in about, uh, I would say, a decade ago when I was trying to turn a theory into practice. Uh, and figure out, okay, if we want to achieve low levels of poverty and we want to create equality and that sort of thing, how exactly do, do you do that uh, on the ground? And I thought, well, to figure that out, we should go find countries where that has been the case or the, the ones that have been the most successful, if not entirely successful, and, and sort of go from there. And that uh, bit of research led me to the Nordic countries which I've been now writing on for about 10 years and gotten, a, I, I think, a bit of expertise uh, on, on how they work and, and at least my perspective on them. Um, that perspective might differ from others, but uh, you know, my, my, my perspective is the correct one. So I thought I would, uh, I would uh, go, go through this uh, a little bit statistically, because to me, when I was uh, researching the Nordic countries, you know, uh, I read a lot of books and you can read a bunch of books about their history and stuff like that and, and their culture and that's all very interesting but if you want to figure out how well do they do and how do they do what they do I think you have to look at actual institutions and actual numbers uh, and, and move away a little bit from these sort of high gloss uh, stories of how they developed and that sort of thing so that's what <coughs> I've tried to do. And so I've, I've put together a little uh, slideshow, which I'm gonna speak over, hopefully, um, called The Case for Nordic Institutions. Um, and pretty brief slideshow, so I'm just gonna kind of go through it quickly and then, and then give a little bit more color. Um, I say that there are three main institutional differences between the US and Nordic countries. The three differences are firstly union coverage, meaning that a far higher percentage of workers are covered by unions in those countries. The second is uh, social spending, meaning they have a lot, a much bigger welfare state. And the third is state ownership, which is uh, that a lot more of their economy is, is run and owned by the state. Um, I would say number two, social spending is probably one you're pretty familiar with. You might also be familiar with number one. I think three, state ownership, that's the one that people often miss um, and one I've tried to spend a lot of time emphasizing. So let's look at the percent of workers that are covered by a union contract. As you can see here in Finland, it's 93%. In Sweden, it's 89%. Norway is, is the laggard of the four. Uh, I, I believe that's because they don't have the system, um, but they're still at 70%, meaning that seven in 10 workers in Norway have their wages and conditions set by a collectively bargained agreement. The US, it's down at 12%, so quite a steep difference. Uh, one thing I would add here is that in addition to having nearly universal union coverage, these countries, with the exception of Finland, also have co-determination laws, which means that workers have control, or rather workers get to control corporate board seats. Um, it depends on the size of the company and the country, but uh, you can get up to as high as being able to appoint 30, I think 33% of the, of the corporate board seats in some of the countries. So workers not only 
negotiate collectively, but they, they also are, uh, have a significant say over the, the top executive function of the country, uh, of a given company, um, if it's big enough. So let's go to the next slide. We have public social spending as a percent of total consumption. Um, as you can see, we have a quite a nice grouping here where they're all at 40%. The US is about half that much. What is social spending? Social spending is uh, education, health care, old age pension, disability pension, child care, uh, the things that go into the welfare state. Um, so this is not total government spending. Total government spending for these countries tends to go up to about 50 or more, I guess, as a percent of total consumption might even be as high as 60. Um, but, but this is the what you might think of as the welfare state spending in particular. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Percent of national wealth owned by government. Norway, 56%. That is actually up around 60% now. And if you take away home ownership in Norway, because a lot of Norwegians own their own home, if you kind of take that out of the calculus and say, well, we're not necessarily concerned about people who own their own home. We're more concerned about ownership of business and enterprise. If you take that out, in Norway, 76% of the national wealth is owned by the government, which is, uh, I think, a truly startling number for a lot of people. <laughs> Finland, it goes down to 31%. Sweden is 24%. One thing I'll say about Sweden is it is 24% now, which is, you know, still decent. Well, you know, one in four uh, kroner is uh, is owned by the uh, a kroner of wealth is owned by the by the governments in Sweden, which is which is high. But it used to be up, up around 50%. It used to be much closer to Norway. So if you, if you look at their wealth series back in, say, the 70s or 80s, it, it got up to around 50%. Since then, unfortunately, the right wing uh, got into control. In the 90s, there was privatization. You know, not a good thing. But e even still, even with all that, 24% owned by the state. Um, Denmark is the laggard on this one, only 11%. The U.S. is less than nothing, negative um, 3.2%. Uh, U.S. government is, is in debt to, uh, to the, the rest of the, of the country. Um, so that's that. One, one thing I will note also um, on the union uh, coverage part, if we could go back to that one, percent of work, workers covered by union contract. I wanted to tell a brief story so that is, this isn't just uh, boring charts. Um, about Finland, which happened very recently, and you probably uh, maybe have seen some of this in the news, which is um, these union workers in these countries, on the one hand, yes, okay, they negotiate better agreements, and we'll, we'll see that in a future slide, but it's not just that, right? And this is the point the left has made uh, abstractly for a long time, but is, is actually true, it seems like, in these countries, which is that the unions have significant political power uh, separate from just setting wages and conditions in given workplaces. And we saw that in Finland just a few months ago when there was a massive strike after a few hundred postal workers had their pay cut. What had happened was they, uh, there were multiple agreements on how to uh, pay for people who work in basically uh, postal logistics. And they moved a few of the workers from one contract to another contract in order to cut their pay. And, you know, it's interesting that that's how they do it. They can't just decide, oh, we're going to cut your pay. They instead have to have a kind of pretense and put you onto a different union contract to do it. But uh, the unions were not happy with that. And there were strikes in, in most of the like key logistical sectors. The airlines went on strike, the ports went on strike, the trains went on strike, uh, the buses, I think, went on strike. Uh, they, 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 they tried to shut the country down, basically, over a few hundred postal workers getting a pay cut. And the result of this, at the end of the day, was the, uh, the prime minister actually had to resign. Um, and that was, uh, you know, he, he, he had also misled uh, people about the nature of the strike and what they knew and when they knew it. But uh, it is interesting, you know, the, the unions forced the prime minister to resign. And if you've seen the, there been a big PR push out of Finland recently for their new prime minister, Sanna Marin, who is the youngest prime minister in the world, a 35 year old woman. Um, she's uh, done a lot to uh, improve the plight of the social democratic party there. But 
Uh, yeah, so I mean, you know, the unions have power. It's not just a paper membership. They actually have enough power to topple the prime minister if, if they don't like uh, what's going on. So that's fun. Um, we can go now to the next section, uh, which is the yellow section, um, and look at the first result of these three institutions, right? So we have high union coverage, high social spending, high state ownership. What is the result of those constellation of institutions? Result number one is low income inequality. Um, and so if you look at the first uh, graph, we have the ratio of 90th percentile earnings to 10th percentile earnings. So to make that clear for those who uh, glaze over a little bit at ideas of percentiles and whatever, you imagine a worker who is, you know, at, at the 90th percentile, so 10% of workers earn more and 90% earn less. They're right on that line. And then you take the 10th percentile worker, 90% earn more and 10% less. So essentially it's a high wage worker relative to a low wage worker. How much more does a high wage worker make than the low wage worker? In the US they make five times as much and the Nordic countries as you see, it's half that. Um, and so that's a big deal. I mean, it's not, it's the, the wage structure is compressed very, very significantly. And um, that means that low wage workers make a lot more, you know, retail workers, workers at, at uh, fast food establishments, they make way more. And it means that uh, workers, you know, who are highly paid professionals or whatever, they're going to make less. That creates a more equal society, um, which is good. And we can go to the next slide, ratio of 90th percentile income to 10th percentile income. And this is an important distinction because the prior slide was about earnings. Earnings means what you get paid for your labor. This is about income. So this is gonna include also capital income, interest, rents, dividends, the stuff the capitalist class takes down. And it's gonna include the welfare state because not everyone earns money. We have elderly people who are retired. We have disabled people, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this brings that all in as well. And when you do that, you still get the same Basic setup here. In the US, the 90th percentile person has about six times as much income as the 10th percentile. In the Nordic countries, it's about half that. Uh, then we can look specifically at poverty. Um, so that's just gonna be a laser focus on, on, on the bottom of society instead of just comparing 90th percentiles to 10th percentiles. And as you can see, the overall poverty rate in the US is 16%. In the Nordic countries, it's uh, you know half that or better. In Denmark, it goes down to 5.5%. It's a third of what it is in the US. Quite, quite an accomplishment. And I will say one thing about Denmark, because uh, I wrote this piece a long time ago, and this is probably true of the rest of them as well, but for whatever reason, I focus specifically on Denmark. It is true that Denmark's poverty rate is 5.5% in the way that it's conventionally measured. But it's important to point out that a lot of that 5.5% is actually students. And students, they do get living grants in Denmark, um, but the living grants are maybe not enough to put them over poverty, um, but they also don't pay tuition and they get uh, loans to top off the rest if they need to. So you put that together and, and, and it's maybe not as bad as it seems. And if you take the students out, it's even lower than that. So, I mean, they, they've, they've come as close as I think I've seen anyone of actually kind of getting rid of poverty in the way that we might, might think about it conventionally. So now we can go to child poverty. It's just the same thing, but for children, as you can see, Denmark's down to 2.9%, which is about, um, you know, what, one sixth of the US poverty rate, huge, huge, huge difference. And then elderly poverty rate as well. It's the same, same story. Um, <coughs> So across the board, kids, overall working age population, poverty is a lot lower in those countries. Um, and that's because of the compressed income distribution, um, which comes from both the unions compressing, compressing the wage schedule, meaning that high wage workers and low wage workers make a much more similar amount of money. And because of the welfare state compressing the overall income differences in the country. So we can go now to the next set of slides. We're almost done, I promise. We're at the purple, we're in the purple slides. And the other result 
is a humane work-life balance. So it's not just that the income is distributed more evenly, it's also that people have a lot more free time and more time with their family. And, and that, that stuff doesn't get picked up in uh, normal economic statistics. We don't count we count any we count free time as a total loss because you're not making any money, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that's how normal people think about it. So it's important to to, to look at what the free free time differences are, um, and so we can go to the first slide there. Weeks of paid parental leave. So if you you know you've had your kid and and you want to take some time off, how how many weeks can you take off? In Finland, it's 161. I actually think that might have gone up recently. Um, in Norway, 91, Sweden, 55, Denmark, 50. So it's a year or more in those countries. Finland's bar includes something that I believe is called the home child care allowance, um, which is sort of like parental leave, but also sort of like home child care. So I don't know what to make of that, but just to give you a sense of why that bar is, is bigger than the others. Um, USA has zero. We have no guaranteed paid parental leave. I think there's, you know, maybe half dozen states that have, uh, you know, two, two, two months, three months of paid parental leave. Um, but we have no national paid parental leave, um, and and the states that do have it, uh, you know, very little, and uh, you know, is just a small fraction of of the country. We can go to the next one, weeks of guaranteed vacation. Very nice uh, consistency there. They all have five weeks of guaranteed vacation. That means that if you're working, you know, a full-time job all year, you will get at least five weeks of vacation. U.S. has no guaranteed weeks of vacation um, by law. Um, I think, you know, conventionally it might be two weeks or something like that. And then the last one, hours worked per worker. So if you were a laborer, how, how many hours do you put in uh, a year? As you can see in the US, up around 1,750. Finland and Sweden's about 100 less than that. Norway and Denmark's about 300 less than that. So think about 300 hours. What does that amount to? If you're working a 40 hour week, that's what, seven and a half weeks? That's, that's the equivalent to seven and a half weeks of extra vacation uh, if you are in Norway and Denmark. Now, I'm not saying they all, they take it that way as vacation, but to give you a sense of what you're talking about, seven and a half weeks on top of whatever you've already, you're already doing in the US, seven and a half weeks of vacation a year per worker. So that's exciting. Um, the last slide uh, grouping, which only has one slide in it, is another result, which is high growth. And I put this in here only because the argument, of course, classically is if you cut down inequality a bunch and you create these welfare state measures, the economy won't grow. There's no incentive to innovate. People won't work, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, what we've seen in the Nordic countries is that they have quite high growth. Um, and we see cumulative growth in GDP per hour worked. Uh, and it's higher in all those countries than it is in the US since 1970, quite a bit higher in some of them. So they grow just as quickly as we do on, a, on an hourly, on a per hour work basis, um, actually grow faster than we do, yet much more equal, higher taxes, a lot higher state ownership, unions, co-determination. It's sort of a, like a fantasy list of of, of American, uh, you know, of, of what the American left has asked for in the US. Um, I mean, in, in fact, beyond what we asked for. Um, and, and, and it's worked, you know, high income, high growth, high employment, low inequality, high tax, all the things that are not supposed to go together do go together in those countries. And, and it's created, as seemed to me, a nice egalitarian uh, little society there. So I think it's worth um, emulating in that sense. Um, but if we can move back from the slides and just kind of talk, I guess, a little bit more generally. Um, when, <clears throat> when people talk about these countries in the discourse, I think there are a couple things that go on, right? So one, on the one hand, well, I guess it's really one thing, but, it, but the different factions orbit around it differently. So you basically have this big question of are they socialists or are they not? And you have conservative writers who I would say until about five or six years ago, every conservative writing about the Nordic countries would say, 
Uh, they are socialists, yes, but they're actually bad. You, you, you know, you think they're good, but you don't understand. They're actually very poor and it's a bad society and there's no innovation and blah, 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 blah. That was the thing they would say, I would say about five plus years ago when I was reading it, every conservative would basically take that line. More recently, that's kind of been flipped on its head and conservatives feel very defensive. I don't know why, but it seems like they are less confident these days that they can convince people that these are kind of uh, not good societies, that they don't work well and that they're not desirable and so on. And so instead, there's been a big push on the right to say, okay, yes, Sweden is a nice country. So is Finland. Yes, these would be good places to live. Uh, yes, uh, they uh, always rank at the top on happiness scores on both subjective and objective measures of well-being, but they're not really socialist. You guys are just mixing up things. In fact, they're more capitalist than we are because they have less regulation and so on and so forth. So that's sort of where conservatives have been on it. I think the flip-flop is kind of interesting um, on that front. On the left, there seem to be two, th two, two, uh, two, two different approaches to thinking about the countries. The one approach, which is the one I favor, is to say that uh, these are quite socialistic countries. They're not where we want to be. Like that's not the end state of society, um, as Francis Fukuyama once said. <laughs> Denmark, I, I think, was his end of history uh, uh, ideal. Uh, we want to go beyond that for sure. We need much more uh, public ownership, much more worker ownership. We, you know, we need more. We need more than what they've got. But you know, socialism is not a pure like binary concept. You can have more and less socialistic societies and they are definitely uh, further along the more side of the spectrum than we are. And insofar as we want to be practical about getting something done and we also want to be somewhat persuasive, it might be useful to have a set of countries where we could say, hey, look, in Norway, the state owns the largest bank, the largest oil company in Finland, they own the largest airliner, uh, you know, go on down the line. In these countries, everyone's in a union. Uh, the workers elect board members to corporations. Like, it's useful, I think, to have examples of in our direction, and, and instead of just having people talk about the Soviet Union or something like that. That's been my approach. But then there's a, a another left approach, which is to say, no, it, pre precisely because we want to go beyond them, we don't want to get people uh, fixated too much on them because we won't, you know. Then, then they'll think that's all we want, but we want more, um, and that's fine. I, you know, I, I don't oppose. You know, it's a different strategies, different rhetorical strategies, I suppose. Um, but I tend to prefer the other one, and I also think, regardless of what your rhetorical strategy is on how to think about the countries, you should at least be clear about what's going on in the countries. And the thing I think is most important, and I'll end it here, in being clear about the countries. What you want to make sure people understand is that it's not just a normal capitalist society with a big welfare state. That is not the only thing going on in the countries. You have across the whole region, the governments own collectively a third of the region's wealth. This is massive. Uh, Nor Norway, the state of Norway owns twice as much of the national wealth than, than the Chinese government owns of the national wealth. Uh, you know, I mean, so, make sure you understand that, they, that these are much more socialized economies than you might think, uh, much bigger public sectors, unionization, co-determination, state ownership, et cetera. That's all there. It's not just the welfare state. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that's what I would emphasize in all this and, 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 and you know, look at their successes. And I think we could build on it. And if you look at it, you know, they got the stuff that we want. You think about the welfare state. They have national health insurance. They have free college. They have very heavily subsidized childcare. They have paid leave. They, I mean, the whole laundry list of what we're trying to get with Bernie and so on, like they've got it and it works. So, you know, it's a good model, I think, uh, for us to, to think about. All right, well, we've been listening to Matt Bruneg, the founder of People's Policy Project and watching his very on-brand uh, charts and graphs. Uh, for the last uh, little bit, he's been breaking down the Nordic um, model, and I, and I really did did like that you mentioned this because I've noticed this. Oh, they're more capitalist than we are. Kind of turn of conservative. Though I think they're a bit soft on the left. It's kind of ridiculous politics. If someone's like, oh yeah, I like socialism, 
isn't isn't Sweden and, and Norway, aren't they great? Like if you're a leftist who responds to that and be like, no, that thing you like, that's not <laughs> that's not good. You know, it just it's a it's a silly way to do politics, even though obviously there are there are limits to to social democracy. But I think it's worth also remembering that, you know, social democracy didn't come from culture or from ethnic homogeneity or from whatever else. It came from class struggle and worker organization. In Sweden, the Social Democratic Party was a second international, you know, Marxist party. In Norway, the Labour Party um, broke from the second international to briefly join Lenin's third international, the Communist International in the 1920s. Uh, their model is constructed on centralized um, wage bargaining, which is controlled by militant industrial, you know, unions. Um, and there was big struggles there in the, in the 60s and 70s for industrial democracy and for deeper forms of, of really socialist, um, you know, deeper socialist socialization. So I, th I think it's worth, you know, remembering that, that the people who created these models thought of themselves as a socialist and they thought they were implementing at least in doses, some form of socialism. So we should kind of take them at their, their word, especially because their model kind of has been working a lot better than than our kind of brutal uh, bosses model here in the, the US. So we have a few questions, but if you want to add yours, please do it in the chat box. And once again, uh, press like on the video and subscribe. It's our only, only ask. Um, so let me see. Okay, so we have a question from Brian Rowe that I guess I'll start with about the durability of the um, the Nordic model. So what about it being undermined in, in Sweden? Let's say recently, uh, there's been a push towards more private um, provisioning and then also just an overall decrease in benefits. Um, in some of the other Nordic countries, you've seen some cuts. Obviously, Norway is a bit insulated because they have all that that oil um, revenue. So what what's what are the trends in these countries? Uh, are we maybe overstating the um, the decline of, of these welfare states, or is there something to it? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, so I think there's a few things, right? So it's definitely they were uh, not insulated from the general trend of the 90s and uh, I guess late 80s, you know, the neoliberal turn, I guess you would say. That hit them just like it hit everywhere. I don't know why this happens. Uh, you, you're seeing it now. Uh, with these far-right nationalist parties, these waves seem to go across all these different countries at the same time, um, which is weird. But, you know, in that sense, I, when I'm thinking about durability, it is true that if you maintain a kind of democratic society where you can, you open yourself up to losing power to the opposition party, then the opposition party can win and then they can do things that you don't like. That, you know, that's the nature of the beast. I think when there are some arguments that say, well, this, is, this collapse sort of in on itself, it was an inherently unstable thing to try to pull this up. I don't think that's true at all. Um, I don't think the country, I think the countries could have basically continued doing what they were doing, um, but they, they lost political fights. And I, you know, that's just a hard thing to deal with. As far as like what has happened, one thing I try to emphasize here is it's true since the 90s that there has been privatization, especially in Sweden. Um, but it is for the US context important perhaps to understand the difference between privatization and what we might think of as government cuts, because you can privatize the delivery of health care and yet still spend a bunch of money on health care. Like in the US, what are we trying to push? We're pushing single payer healthcare right now. That's our big thing in the health sector. That still includes privatized hospitals. Uh, you know, like that's what happened in, in Sweden uh, when they privatized is they basically went to a single payer system and went away from more of a national health service type system. That's where we're trying to go. So it's like them moving right puts them in a position where they're still to the left of even where Bernie Sanders is, you know, so. Right, no, no, I think that that's definitely important to to take into account. And that's also why when people sometimes say things like, 
oh, Boris Johnson is to the left of Bernie Sanders because Boris Johnson believes in the NHS. <laughs> it's just kind of like a ridiculous cross-country comparison. And, and one, one country we've already, um, you know, has accomplished these, these creation of these big public institutions. In the other country, we have, we have nothing. So obviously the demands are, are very difficult to, to compare. Um, so there's one question that's a little bit more of a, a political question, which is, um, and you kind of already touched on this, but uh, one thing, uh, the question, I'm sorry, I didn't write down the name, um, struggles to articulate is a need in the United States to both fight for and envision a move beyond social democracy uh, and also defend social democracy. So I guess, I guess in your experience, how do you articulate the fact that you want to defend the triumphs of this system, but also you think that there is, even in the, the kind of sense of moral justice or egalitarianism, there's something better that we could pursue. Uh, how, do you, how do you balance both advocating uh, advances in the direction of a system, but ultimately wanting to transcend the system? Um, well, I guess it depends on your view on, on gradualism, I guess, or reform and, and, and how far you can go with it. Because to me, I think you can, on paper at least, you can kind of walk, you can keep walking towards a more socialized economy. I mean, if you look at what the Social Democratic Party did in Sweden for its 40 year reign, in which it was much more socialistic uh, in the way that it presented itself uh, you know, it had Marxist economists that would call themselves Marxist economists, uh, which is maybe not, not so much anymore. What they did from the early 20th century to the mid 20th century is year after year after year, they increased the amount of wealth that was owned publicly. It went up from, I think, somewhere in the mid teens to about 50%. That did not happen overnight. It happened year after year after year. So to my mind, you can just... And this is what you've also seen with the welfare state when it was implemented is they didn't implement all the benefits at once. You get one benefit in, you say, oh, isn't that great? Don't you like that? Well, we can keep doing that. And social ownership is maybe a little bit more abstract and harder to get people to understand that. Like you can't say, hey, remember we went from 15% state ownership to 20% state ownership? Let's, we could keep ratcheting that up. Um, like, oh, well, who cares? I don't know, like normal people might not care about that. The welfare state is easier, I think. You say, hey, you remember when we got free childcare? Yeah, well, we could also do free college or we could also do, you know, um, that one I think is an easier ask. But yeah, I don't know like fundamentally how you, how you get people on board with continuing to go because obviously in the process of going, coming from where we are to where we're trying to go, you definitely do reach a point which it's pretty nice, you know, like these countries are pretty nice and maybe people do get, you know, satiated with that, so. Well, in, in the crisis of the, the 60s and 70s, what it was was, I think, a sense of extremely low unemployment plus a sense of political po possibility that social democracy opened up actually deepened some people's desires, at least the militants and the, the trade unions, their desire to talk about questions of democracy and industrial potential. But that wasn't the only appeal. It wasn't just a moral, we need a leap together into socialism because socialism is better than capitalism. It was a concern that the actions of private capitalists were undermining the model. So capitalists were hoarding excess profits and not reinvesting that profits into production. So maybe we could create these wage earner funds administered by trade unions and they would do a better job. So it, it was. It wasn't just you know obviously this ideological appeal. It was. It was at least rooted in this is the way we preserve the model. We radicalize, and maybe in fact we don't need to do that um, to preserve a social democratic model. I would love to find out. Let's find out in the 2020s and 2030s. Uh, well, maybe maybe the 2020s are looking kind of bleak. <laughs> 2030s and 2040s uh, maybe. Um, so there's a question from Joe that that gets to kind of a hot button issue that's repeated constantly by uh, both right wingers uh, and increasingly by, by liberals and others in, in, you know, in academia especially, which is what do you say to criticism that um, the smaller size of the Nordic countries, but, but also particularly its racial and ethnic homogeneity uh, make it easier for them to, to create a socially cohesive 
welfare state? What should our response uh, be as socialist universalists to this critique that you know the, the only reason why these states that we kind of like um, are able to do the things we kind of like is because they're they're um, you know less uh, ethnically diverse and so on. Yeah. So uh, on the smallness point, um, that I think the smallest point is exact has it exactly backwards. I think it's a lot harder to do what they've done in a small country than a big country, and the main reason for that is because the small countries are very dependent on exports to survive. In Sweden, uh, exports are 50% of GDP. Fifth half of what they produce is exported. Uh, and of course, if you're a small country, that has to be the case because you're not going to be able to produce everything that you need or want to live on in a small frozen country. You're going to have to trade with other people to make that happen. Uh, in the U.S., our exports are, uh, I think, 11, 12% of GDP. So we're less exposed to the international economy than they are, which means that we're less disciplined by it. Um, we also obviously have uh, imperial might, which makes us less disciplined, though that's uh, probably not something to play up. Um, so yeah, I think this, the smallness, I think, has it exactly backwards. Like in terms of population size, the bigger you are, the better, better shot you have at, at pulling this sort of stuff off. The bigger your land mass, the more resources, the more diversified your economy is able to be. Um, I think that makes it easier. In terms of homogeneity, this one is a, a somewhat more uh, complicated question. Obviously, it matters to some degree. Um, you know, we've seen the, you know the, the classic in the U.S. You get the poor whites get turned against the poor blacks, and and you know that's a strategy that people use to undermine egalitarian uh, economies. Uh, but these countries are not nearly as homogenous as they used to be. Um, Sweden has a very high rate of immigration, higher than us as a percent of population. I read the other day Oslo is a 30% non-ethnic Norwegian. Um, these countries have taken on a lot of immigrants, and you know, there there have been far right you know reactions to that, uh, which have not been good. But the overall economic models have persisted, even even with you know less homogeneity. The last thing I'll say on that is homogeneity is is somewhat relative, right? So just because you look at a country and you think it's homogenous, that doesn't, that doesn't mean it necessarily is um, to people who live there. So, you know, Finland had a civil war, a red versus white civil war. Is that, you know, <laughs> that, that's not a cohesive homogenous country when uh, the, you know, you have a Russian style civil war in which tons and tons of people kill one another. Like there's, there's some sort of tension underlying that. Um, in, and in Finland, they have a Swedish People's Party because there's like a bunch of Swedes in Finland and they're like sort of upset about the Finns and, you know, these sort of relations. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's what I'd say. Yeah, and actually one interesting thing about the Finland and its civil war is that the kind of father of Swedish social democracy, or at least its most famous figure of its most radical period, Ola Palma, uh, the prime minister, uh, from the late 60s to uh, his assassination in the mid 80s, uh, besides for, I think he's out of office for around four or five years in the middle of that. Uh, he is named after his uncle, who was a um, officer, Swedish officer, who volunteered in the Finnish uh, Civil War, but on the side of the whites, because he was from a very wealthy um, family and both his uncles fought and one of his uncles who he was named for, um, you know, died. Uh, defending the Finnish landowning uh, uh, class. And I'm sure his grandmother was very disappointed uh, with the people he associated with, even when he was prime minister. So these were class societies and these were brutally unequal societies. Um, all right, let me get through a few of these quickly. Sean Young, which came first in the North Nations, strong unions or a strong or a social democratic government? Uh, oh, the unions, unions, right? yeah. yeah, yeah, the unions came first. The unions also, are why they got universal suffrage, um, so. Yeah, and actually one interesting thing, like to the extent particularities about Sweden, for example, mattered, uh, the fact that Sweden was a late industrializer probably helped it because it started off with really class conscious industrial unions instead of small craft unions. And those industrial unions like were easier to organize like by 
you know, in the interest of this broader class project, maybe. So it's like little things like that, you know, about history and about developmental trajectories definitely have an influence on political possibilities. Um, so it's not just to say that none of this, you know, matters, but um, people have kind of bent the stick in the other direction and focused, I think, too much on, on Nordic particularities as a way to say, we can't get these things that clearly every uh, working class and poor person um, in the US uh, deserves. All right, so two related um, questions. There's a question from Paul Prescott on, um, um, are there just right-wing opposition movements sprouting up or are there any viable parties to the left of social democracy um, or the existing kind of ruling labor parties um, uh, springing up in the Nordics? Uh, then I guess I'll kind of tie this one to it. Um, are there any attempts, um, uh, or even theoretically, I guess, um, uh, could the sovereign wealth fund in Norway be used uh, like a public venture capital to further market socialism? So kind of unrelated questions. One, one is, uh, before I, I merge those questions together, I didn't finish uh, reading the second question. So those are quite unrelated questions. You can take them separately, but one was, what's going on left to social democracy in the Nordic countries? And the second one is, uh, what can we do with this sovereign wealth fund? Can, can we use it in the, in the interest of market socialism? Yeah, so, you know, each of, the part, each of the countries have parties that are left of the social democrats or the labor party. You got left alliance in Finland, you've got the left party in Sweden, you've got a, a few of them in Norway. I think the most left is the red party. Um, I'm not sure, I don't, the, the, the Danish ones escape me at the moment. Um, but you know, these are proportional representative parliaments. So the odds of any one of these parties being, becoming, you know, like winning an outright majority, 51% of the parliament is essentially zero. Um, it's the same for the social Democrats. You know, you're always working in coalition. Um, even when the Swedish social Democrats were dominating the country for so long, uh, they, they were in coalition as well um, with uh, rural agrarian parties and stuff like that. So, you know, you have to work that, that angle, I guess. Uh, hope, hope that maybe you could one day become the biggest party in the left of center block. Um, if not, you, you get concessions in each, in each government that's formed. Um, as far as what they're pushing, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't know, actually. I know the Finnish one uh, was very interested in basic income. That was a big thing that they were talking about for a while. There's a lot of just sort of managing the affairs of, of you know, this or that, opposing privatization, fighting you know neoliberalism and shifts in the in the in the country in that direction um i know there are some people in the in the danish left i know because they contact me <laughs> and tell me this that are you know trying to push various things like social wealth fund like uh you know um norway has or like the minor plan um, there are some people in finland who are interested in that as well so there are people that are do have like market socialists much like in line with what I'm interested in, but I don't know how many there are. Those are those are the ones that contact me, which obviously is a bit biased. Um, as far as the sovereign wealth fund itself, so it's important. Norway has uh, their big big fund, which is called the oil fund or sometimes the global fund. That one is invested solely outside of Norway, so they own stocks and bonds and real estate throughout the world, mostly the developed world. Um, and you know that's what it is but it's important to emphasize that's not the, that's not the only thing going on in norway i think a lot of people think oh they just have this big oil fund the oil funds only invested globally they also have a domestic sovereign wealth fund uh the norwegian pension fund norway i think it's called no government pension fund norway anyways it's the norwegian one and they also own things through like state-owned enterprise arrangements, sort of like the postal service or whatever. Like the postal service is not in a fund, but it's owned by the government. And when you add up all that stuff, the state already owns 33% or more of Norwegian domestic equity, domestic corporate equity. Um, to give a comparison in Sweden, the minor plan, which everyone loves, et cetera, et cetera, uh, it only ever got up, I think, to six or 7%. So Norway is like five times beyond what the minor plan ever got. And that's not counting the oil fund. That's just their domestic state ownership. Um, 
So yeah, I don't know that you even need that fund. I think they're already, you know, on the path to doing that. Um, but yeah, you could, if you wanted to liquidate some of that fund, bring the money in and, and socialize the rest of the Norwegian economy that way. I mean, you could do that tomorrow if you wanted, because it's, it's so big. Um, it's a question of politics and do people want to do that? Do they care enough to do that? That sort of thing. Well, you know, I, I think one interesting thing about, about social democracy in these places that, you know, there's still, these parties still have left currents. So there's the, that force that exists within society within these broad center left, you know, parties. Uh, then there's these left oppositions. I guess one part of Paul's question was, can any of them, you know, threaten to take state power or pass the, um, the um, center left parties? Uh, I would say nowhere is that probably true. At best, they aspire for either coalition partnerships or, you know, um, confidence arrangements. Uh, so in Denmark, they've turned a not great social democratic party into a defender of, of certain you know, important uh, policy outcomes, which have been you know, very good, uh, especially in coronavirus um, crisis. And you know, it's playing, uh, left alliance is playing a similar role in uh, Finland. And actually uh, one of our, our comrades on the socialist left is the um, education minister now in uh, Finland. And that's obviously, uh, a socialist education minister in the country that has, by outcomes, the best education system in the world. You know that's that's not a uh, a bad thing for our movement and our in our cause. Um, so um, I think that might be a good place to wrap it up. I mean, there's a couple of other um, interesting questions, but I feel like they're going to uh, take us down rabbit holes that we uh, cannot resolve in the next um, uh, nine minutes. Uh, but just as a reminder, uh, tomorrow we have John Clegg, oh, sorry, not tomorrow, we're off tomorrow. Um, on Monday, we have John Clegg talking about the relationship between slavery and capitalism. On um, Tuesday, uh, Branko is giving his uh, Joe uh, Biden uh, kind of political biography. It's not a favorable one, but it is a very interesting one because it's not just a polemic, like I mentioned before. Branko has spent the poor guy spent hundreds of hours of his life um, reading um, things written and said by Joe Biden, uh, examining his political history, um, talking to people who who knew um, uh, Biden. You know, reading archives from you know the Delaware newspapers in 1972 when he first ran, uh, pretending to be something of his of a McGovern <laughs> uh, Democrat um, to uh, to today. So that should be really interesting. Um, and, you know, once again, thanks to Matt for joining us. Uh, please press like and subscribe to the video. Uh, please check out People's Policy Project. Uh, they've uh, been really indis indispensable for us and I think will play a very important role in the next 10 years. So we've, we've put a link in the description. Check them out. Uh, give them your, your money. And um, besides for that, we'll see you on Monday. And thanks again, Matt. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.